study today, our intent is to explain to you in a, in a, in a simple way the importance of having convictions about specific things. In this month, we will spend the entire month talking about this topic. It is part of our larger series for the year, which is called Building a Future. My argument is, if you're going to build a future, you build a future by making specific changes in your life. And you have to understand, you are building a future. This is not something that will just happen. The first thing we said was you have to change your mind. You have to build a new way of thinking. And for one month, we talked about that. Once you change your mind, you have to secondly change your approach. So can you say those with me, please? Say change your mind. Change your mind. Or I said it, don't say build a new mind, build a new mind. and build a new approach. Build a new approach. You have to build a new way to land your plane, to land your life. Once you build your new mind, and you can cut the lights on, guys, so everybody can see. I'd appreciate that. Build a new mind, build a new approach. Then you have to build a new conviction. You have to have clear convictions about what you believe. If you do not build clear convictions, you will be everywhere. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about, about prayer? What do you believe about your life? What are your convictions? It's really, really important to not get confused because around you, there are people who don't have clear convictions. When you talk about convictions, you might say convictions about what? You see, a conviction is a firmly held belief. A firmly held belief about what? Well, today we get specific. Today I talk about work. I believe you have to have a clear conviction about work if you want to build a future. And if you don't have a clear conviction about work, you will end up um, not receiving the things you want. Imagine a life where you never get what you want. Imagine a life where you, you live every day, work every day, and every dream you have falls off the cliff of disappointment. I want to show you some principles, some things that can help you get to where you want to be. Because again, a lot of Christians think, well, if I just pray, it happens. But it doesn't just happen. So the big question for today is, what is your conviction about work? What do you think? When I ask you about working, you want God to prosper you, bless your life. What is your conviction about that? Next week, you're going to love the sermon because I'm talking about um, what's your conviction about wealth? I believe there's a lot I, I'm going to say about that that's really important, and it's been an issue for me. I have a strong belief that Christian teaching sometimes makes you anti-wealth. And, and believe me, wealth is powerful because wealth gives you time and space. If you have wealth, you don't worry about missing a day of work. If you have, if you have t Money is one thing, wealth's another. Wealth gives you time and space. And, and so for churches to not have wealth and not have resources, which is what wealth is, is having resources. It's having enough resources to do what you want to do. It's not just a dollar amount. It's space, time. It's all of that. It's amazing what it can do for you. And so that's next week. But let me, if I can, summarize for you some work convictions that I think you must have. And there are five. And I want you to repeat them with me, please. Say, so have work that you're responsible for. Have a land that you're working on. Have a joyful attitude towards your work. Have an earn your own living attitude. Having have a prepare for the future work attitude. Those are five convictions you must have. Five simple ways that you must think when it comes to work. This is fundamental stuff. This is the stuff that gets you started. This is what you want your kids to know. This is what you try to teach kids in school. This is why you give homework. This is why you give chores around the house. You're trying to instill these five principles. You're trying to get them to understand this is how it works. These are simple. And there are five verses that we pull this from, and I, I love notes because you don't have to turn the pages and get lost and hope you can keep up. So there are five simple things, and it starts with the principles in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Here you have Adam and Eve, and God starts off, the first thing he does is he gives them a responsibility, something that they have to work on for themselves. 
Do you have work that you are solely responsible for? Here's what Genesis 2.15 says. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. Notice the first thing he does is I want you to take care of this by yourself. It's your responsibility. Nobody else is going to do it. Just you. But if you don't do it, it won't get done. I believe you have to have work that you are totally responsible for. No matter where you are in life, you've got to have something that you do. And there's something powerful. Now, I did not give you the verse, but if you read on in chapter 2, he goes on to say, I also want you to name the animals. He wanted him to have something that he did physically and something he did mentally. There's something about the way you're wired. Some people will never be fulfilled in life because they're not doing the two things that they were designed to do. You're designed to be physically active and engaged. Imagine this. This is the guy outside taking care of the garden. He's an environmentalist. This is a guy that cares about the grass. He cares about the dirt. His hands are dirty. He's a guy. God wanted him out there every day taking care of the garden. And then he said, I want you to use your mind. I want you to be educated. I want you to learn. He told him in one text, subdue the earth. I want you to go out and find out why the grass is green. I love, I love Schofield's comment about that verse. He said, it's the Magna Carta to be educated. It's the great challenge for you to go and learn something. You cannot be successful if you don't subdue the world around you. And he says, I, that's what I want for you. I want you to have something. You are responsible for, Adam, you name these animals. Nobody else. You, you, you're, you are responsible for this. He told Adam and Eve, I give you, in chapter 1, verse 28, I give you dominion. I give, I, God bless them, not just the man, and God said to them, have dominion, have rulership. I want you both engaged in managing this world. It's your responsibility. Can you say that's what you please say? It's my responsibility. My say it again. Come on, say this is my responsibility. My it's really important to understand that. The second thing that's important is that you not only have work that you're responsible for, but you have what I call a land that you work on. I call it Ricky Temple land. People, sometimes when I meet them, I'll say to them, how is your world? And they look at me like, in my world, yes, where you stand. Ricky Temple land. What, what's the name of your land? See, you're scared. Come on, what's the name of your land? You know, it's so hard to say that because it sounds like you're being selfish. No, this is truly your land. Let me tell you when you know it's your land. When your car breaks, nobody outside of your land fixes it. <laughs> when people, you tell people, my land is in trouble. I need some rent money. They go, I'm praying for your land. Lord, bless their land. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, bless the land. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. You've got to work your land. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. God, I don't have time to show you this. I don't. I did a book review with the men today in our men's meeting. Write the book down. You can read it on your own. I'm not going to read it. I don't have time. Come on, say, he does not have time. So this is quick. You ready? This is right there. This is not in your notes. Here you go. There's a book called Do More Work. Stop the busy work and start the work that matters. It's got by a guy named Michael Steiner, S-T-E-I-N-E-R. It's a great book. And in the book, he, quote, he talks about how he came to write the book, Do More Good Work. He came to write it because he was reading another book by a graphic designer named Milton Glaser. That's the guy who made the sign that said, you seen the I Love New York? That's the guy who came up with that graphic. And in the book, he made the statement, which was a, 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 a grabber for, for Michael Steiner, and it went like this. He says he opens his book with a curious and powerful insight. He says everything we do falls into three basic categories, bad work, good work, great work. Say it with him, please. Come on. Bad work, good work, great work. His point is that a lot of times what we end up doing is really not helpful. It's bad work. And bad work is a waste of time, energy, and life. It doesn't make sense. And sometimes if we're honest, and that's all I can tell you about that right now, but if I'm honest and if we're honest, there is a problem with wasting our life, wasting our time, pursuing things that don't matter. And that's what this number two note is about. Have a land that you're working on. He says, worthless pursuits lack sense. 
what are you doing that is a waste of time? And it's not only a waste of time, it's really destroying your life. If you step back and look at this and you're like, this is not helping me at all. And for some of you, it's a dating relationship. It is absolutely destroying your values, your Christian commitment. You are doing things you would never do, ever would consider. This is wasting your life away. It's destroying your convictions. All of your convictions are beginning to be in question now. You're back to drinking. You're back to drugging. You're back to the life. You are back to sliding. Oh, you're, you're justifying everything. You're moving in because you feel like you just have to. You're just, you're just not what you used to be. And it's because you, your convictions are being challenged. And you don't have clear convictions, you'll end up in a place you don't want to be. So you must have certain convictions about your life, about your work. And you must say, I cannot sit in the break room and talk about the boss. That's a waste of time. Why am I in here? Why am I in this conversation? Is this going to get me a promotion? Will they like me more? How about just pray? I can't change anything today. There's a time to speak up. I do think you need to speak truth to power. I do, but there's a way to do it. And so the question is, are you doing it right? Have work that you're responsible for. Have a land that you work on. Number three, have a joyful attitude towards your work. This is a great verse. It's in Colossians chapter 3. And I love the way he says this because here's what he says, and this is the bottom line of it. When I work, I've got to act like I'm working for God even if I'm working for a job. When I go to work, I don't go to work with the attitude that, okay, I'm just working for Joe or John or whoever or this company. I am working like I work for God. Here's what Colossians chapter 3 says, verse 22. Whatever you do, work heartily. That means from your heart, as if you're working for the Lord and not for men. Here's why. Knowing that from the Lord, not from the man, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You're serving the Lord Christ. There's something about getting in your mind, I'm working for God. Now, here's the problem. Most people don't see their work as work for God. They only see church work as work for God. And so what I'm doing is work for God. What you're doing is not work for God. And it's absolutely untrue. There's a great book years ago called Your Work Matters to God. And it's true that there are a lot of people who think that, and it's not true. Your work matters. It has value. It, 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 is, it is so important for you to get this because we oftentimes fail to see the value of going to a job and clocking in and doing a good job. But if you really want to see God help you build the right future, you've got to take work seriously. So have work that you're responsible for. Have work that land that you work on, have a joyful attitude towards your work, and then, number four, have an earn-your-own-living attitude. Second Thessalonians has always been a powerful verse because this verse says something that's hard to do. Here's what it says. He says, for even when we were with you, Paul says, we, were, we would give you this command. If anyone is not I mean, it's just, kids, if you don't clean up today, you're not eating. Don't do that. You go to jail. But you understand what I'm saying. The bottom line is not about your kids not doing their homework or something. It's not about some one-time punishment. It's, it's about the result of a lifetime of not working. Sometimes when I hear people complain, I go, tell me about your work schedule. How many hours are you working? Problem is there's not enough work. There's not enough investment. I believe in resting and I believe in balance, and you hear me talk about that a lot, but I also believe in working. There are times when you've got to put the metal to the pedal and not be afraid of it. Here's what he says, first Verse, um, verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 11, 12. For, he says, um, uh, let's read it again. For when, even when we're with you, we would give this command. If any is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. <laughs> now such persons we command and encourage as the Lord Jesus Christ to do their that's a big one when you heard all that. There, get it out, Temple. There, <laughs> their work quietly and to earn their own living. Say, my own living. living. It's really important for you to understand that you have to earn your own living. You have to earn your own living. It's not somebody's responsibility. When people come up to me sometimes, and, and, and I, I'm really generous, I'm a nice guy and all that, but I've learned over the years that I never saw, I never made friends with money. I've only made enemies. 
I, I just, that's just my story. I, I'm, like I said, I, I got stories, stuff I've done that's very generous. But I've just learned that if you make people dependent upon you, you make an enemy, not a friend. You have to always encourage people to, to that place of independence because that's where God designed them to be. They were designed to have their own land, their own car, their own money, their own space. And, and I want to encourage you in that direction. I believe in helping, and I think some parents cut loose too, too quickly. And I think some parents miss the long-term investment of staying with kids and riding with them, even as adults, to the place of promise. I think there's a value in that, but you must make sure they're, they're work, they are working to earn their own living. As long as they're doing that, don't be afraid to help. There's something powerful about the balance here. And I love the fact that, that he says that's the goal, have an earn your own living attitude. Number five and the last one is have a prepare for the future attitude. Now, this is tough for Christians because I think sometimes, I don't know, we live in the now, but this great verse in Proverbs 6 says, go to the ant. And he uses a strong word, you sluggard, strong word. Consider her ways and be wise. Look at the ant and learn something. Here's what's powerful. Which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, that's the power of the whole verse. This ant has no one saying, get up in the morning, go to work. No one says it. But provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. That is what you should be like. Someone who's preparing for the days when there are no harvest coming. There is no harvest coming, brother. And you know the dark days, the rainy days are coming. It is, it is, it is in the fiber, and I think it's really tragic, in Christian teaching. Um, to not amass resources <clears throat> and not save. It's not part of our teaching. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's, it's part of our teaching to bless people, so give, but we are anti-building wealth in our culture. And that's why it's always tough. It's tough in church sometimes to get people to understand, no, we need to be wealth builders. The ant gets it. Your parents used to call it saving for a rainy day. And I think sometimes it's hard. and It's been hard for me. One of my greatest weaknesses has been generosity. I get it now. I thank God that I survived my madness, which means I made enough to survive being crazy. But the thing I understand now is you can read this, and this is something I, that I've, I've discovered. You can read a verse, but until you see it fleshed out, you miss it. You need a father, a mother, or someone around you. And I really believe that in the culture, in some cultures, it's more common for them to see investments and long-term savings and those kind of things. But I want to say survival mindsets have settled in a lot of communities. And that's dangerous. We've got to find a way to make sure, and you're going to see a lot of this next week when I talk, because there's some principles I'm going to share with you, that will help you get your mind to another place of conviction. You are not called to just survive. That is not a healthy way to live. Proverbs 10, verse 4 says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. God wants you to work hard. God wants you to be okay. I close with this final thought. Work convictions that I believe expand your life. And I want to use Matthew 28, 19. Now, this is a surprise verse to use because it's always used to talk about the importance of a person coming to know God and our, our, this our call to go and touch the whole world. Here's what it says in Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, <clears throat> excuse me, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. When this verse is read, it's always used evangelistically, which is a proper use of it. Jesus' last command, go and touch the world. That's exactly right. But there's work involved. This is not going to happen without people who work. And what I want you to see first in this text is that he's saying, go beyond your current world and explore. That's not free. I want you to go and make disciples of all ethnic groups, all nations, all ethnosis, everybody Everybody, not just people who look like you. And that, that's going to require traveling. You can't just stay home. The work element in this is amazing. You're talking to guys who lived in the same town, in the same city. These were, these were fishermen. These were guys who were local worker labor guys. You don't really have a whole lot of sophistication in the 12 disciples. 
but he challenges them to explore. Dream beyond your world. Expand your mind. Think a new thought. Open your heart to something different. Go ye therefore into all the world. Guys, I want you to leave just the Jews. I want you to go to all the world. Say that with me, please. Come on. That's what he said to them. I want you to go to all the world. I want you to preach the gospel to everybody. There's an, an amazing thought. And so I thought it'd be fun to put down for you some facts about how far he went and how far they were called to go. So we're just looking at Jesus. And notice, I put it in notes for you, Jesus walked uh, during his whole three-year public ministry about 3,125 miles, thereabout. Go to California, come back to Phoenix, thereabout. Or go to California, go a little bit further in the ocean, 3,000 miles. Amazing. Grand total miles Jesus walked in 33 years on earth. This is all of his life. 40, 400 miles he walked from Egypt to Nazareth, 18,000 miles from Nazareth uh, to Jerusalem, 3,125 miles he walked in his ministry for a grand total of 21,525 miles. That's a lot of miles. Tell you, David, that's a long way. Come on, that's a long way. That's an average of 20 miles a day. Please know that on all these journeys, that's an average of about 1,076 days and nights he was on the road which averages out to 2.7 days a month or 32 days a year. A lot of walking. Now, if you don't think that's long, I want you to just get up and just walk for almost three days <laughs> straight every month. <laughs> Nonstop. It's a lot of walking. What's interesting is the distance around the world in the equator is 24,901.55 miles, which means he almost walked around the world. Amazing, isn't it? Now, all of that to me is profound work. I'm going to let you pause. I'm not going to entertain the seven questions because I want to jump to something else for a minute as I close and my time's almost up. I want to just ask you this question. Look at me for a second. Your work. Can God use your work to get you to a place that you dream? Is that possible? It is if you're willing to do three things. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Matthew chapter 7 is what I want you to read ahead. It's your read ahead first for next week. The three things he said that I think make the difference in your work. You have to ask, you have to seek, and you have to knock. Can you sit those three with me, please? Come on. Ask, seek, knock. This is what I believe. I believe that my work attitude matters, but I think that sometimes we settle where we are and we never really ask God for anything else. Every now and then, I think you get to a place that you're just not willing to seek anything new. You're not knocking on any new doors. And then lastly, I think sometimes you're not taking advantage of where you are. Why don't you for a minute just pretend that where you are is where you need to be right now. You have another dream. You ask, you pray, you seek, you knock. But where you are right now, I want you to just join me in a prayer. I want to pray that God would bless your work. I want to pray that God would help you rise in your mind and heart to appreciate your job. Tomorrow you're going to scare everybody and you're going to go to work and smile. <laughs> They're not going to know what to do. They may even call the ambulance. But I want you to consider thanking God. If you don't have a job, if you don't have the job you want, I want you to, like a helicopter flying over your head, see God's grace. <laughs> Lift your hand, say, in the name of Jesus, God's grace will prosper me. I believe like a helicopter to rain on you, God's hand and blessing. So, Lord, today I declare in the lives of your people as we close today that you would prosper them. Our work matters. We need to have some clear convictions about our work, the way we approach it, the way we manage it, the way we handle it. I pray, God, that for people who are battling with this work issue, some are wives, housewives, and they're struggling, saying, should I stay home? And should I live on one income? And they don't know what to do. If the numbers work, I pray they stay home. And if it doesn't work, I pray you'd guide them to a balance. Some are asking, how hard should I work? I pray, God, they work hard, but that it would be fruitful. Some are saying, what if I don't make enough money? I pray, God, they would balance their lives with what they have until they can make more money. If they're struggling, some of them are trying to serve God like some pastors, Lord. They, 
They're trying to find balance. I pray whatever, wherever they are, with their work, their job, that they would simply take a moment and allow you to create options for them. Options, Lord God, that maybe they can't see today. While they're creating options, may they be patient and trust you in faith. I pray, God, that your spirit would bless your people today. And I pray that they would leave this church today confident that God's hands on their life. Now, with every head down, every hand down for a minute, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I heard the message. I know you talked about work today, but the work that I need to do, the most important thing I could ever do is give my life to Jesus. My decisions today are, 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 are really centered around one important issue. I need to give Christ my life. For some of you, the problem is you've never really done that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want me to pray for you, and you say, Pastor, I want to get my life right. That's the work I want to do today. I want you simply to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I see you. Anybody else? I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. God bless you. And I see your hands over there. I see you there. I see several of you. Ten, so plus. Touch these hands and those who are home who say, Jesus, I need you in my life. From communion to now, they get it. They see the need to start a new walk with Jesus. Every hand lifted in the building. We lift our hands with these, and we pray with them and believe that their lives start today. A new beginning with God. A blessed start. And we honor you and we give you all the praise and we give you all the honor in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. Now, here's